common to you. Maybe you, are you ready for a sermon? Okay. Are you here intending to hear something, even small, that will impact who you are and how you live? Okay. Because if that's not your intention, then it won't happen. Right? Basic math. Okay? I'm not so concerned about you hearing my voice as I am you hearing his. Because he can talk through anything. Right? But this is the message he's inspired for today. It's entitled, I am the boss of you. Okay? That's the title of our message today. We live in a society right now that absolutely does not want to hear this. Okay? The other night, I took the Facebook app off my phone because I've realized that I am a bit of an addict to just social media, and I don't think I am, but I'm like, Bleep, every time there's two-minute pause and like, Bleep, Facebook. And apparently people have noticed that, that I didn't notice, and I don't want to be the addict that doesn't think he has a problem and he can stop anytime he wants. I'm just going to be like, take the app off the phone. I can still answer messages and stuff, but I made the decision I'm going to take that and put it over here. That being said, I'm probably as active as I have ever been in commenting and making statements as a pastor. So this week, I put a statement out that simply said, as a minister of the Word of God, I have to say this is what I believe is the biblical take on a very heated subject called abortion. Now, many, many, many Christians and people who are what they would tag pro-life can be very cold and they focus on only one of two victims in this thing. Okay, there are so many people that need to know that people love them. There are so many women who, if they had families around them and support around them, would feel as though they had multiple choices where some really feel like they have none. Okay? Well, inside of this, comments go back and forth, and what does happen is people can be very nasty on both sides of any issue you'll ever face. And to be loving toward people is harder through a social media or a text than it is face to face because you can't interpret body language. People can't sense my compassion in a typed word. But there are times when comments will come up and I, as a pastor, I need to bring biblical clarity to those things. Okay? A couple of them that are very common is God doesn't judge anyone. That's just not true. Does he love every person? Absolutely. To their final breath, he has given his life blood for them, died, poured out his blood, was tortured to pay for the sin of every man. Is every single person a sinner in need of a Savior? Yeah. Am I better than somebody convicted of the worst crime you could think of sitting in jail? I'm not better than them. I'm a sinner saved by grace who is a brother to the worst. And the word of God says, but for the grace of God, there go I. My sins just happen to be more socially acceptable than theirs. That is the main difference between us. Another one, whether it's killing someone or you know, eating too many burgers, a sin's a sin and God doesn't care. Not really true. The Bible says there are sins that God hates. Feet that are swift to shed innocent blood is one of them. Yeah. It is. God does really not like gluttony either. And as an American society, we are probably most guilty of that one in total ignorance. So let me challenge you as your pastor. Be mindful of how you feed the temple that the Holy Spirit lives in. Because we will answer for that someday. And that is, that is something I am not great at all the time. So please, like, like, hey, pastor, are you pastor hypocrite or pastor live what you preach? Okay, you're not going to chase me away if you ask me that question. And that's actually part of your job. Okay? Let's look at a couple of scriptures today. Romans 1, 18 through 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
This scripture is saying that as human beings, the sin that exists in our life can only exist there and stay there relatively peacefully if we suppress the truth. If I hate my neighbor, and I'm cool with that, the only way I can live at peace, hating my neighbor, is if I suppress the truth that God has said to the merciful, I will show mercy. Pray like this, Lord, forgive me my debts as I forgive those who debt against me. I have to suppress that truth in order to live relatively peacefully with my sin. That's the only way. Feeling okay about something that the Bible says is wrong is not the new covenant. Okay, that's not Jesus did away with the law and he wiped away sin, so now I just feel okay about these things that God has said are sin. That's a perversion of the truth of what the Bible says. Okay? And in those cases, we literally suppress the truth. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their flesh to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What we live in mainly in our society is simply humanism. Okay? And by definition, what that is, is a worldview that puts man at the center. So many people will look at the God of the Old Testament and say, well, in fact, I had a, a statement this week in a, in a conversation. Well, what about all these times where God unfairly killed people in the Old Testament? And I, all I responded was, just realize that when you say that, you're talking about an event that happened 2,500 years ago with the assumption that you know exactly what it is that God did based on exactly what God saw in his sovereignty and all-knowingness and in his loving nature looking at a breath in light of eternity and you would have made a totally different decision and God is actually at fault for what he did. You're actually judging God. Now, for a person who denies God's existence, is an atheist, or hates God, to judge God makes sense. But a, if a person calls their life by the name of Christ and judges the actions of God in any case, you are simply out of line. You're out of line. You would have to know all that God knows. You would have to see all that he sees. You would have to be so intimately acquainted with every life and every situation that you could tell me how many hairs are on the head, in the nose, ears of every person involved, their intentions, their thoughts, what they had to work with, what they didn't, their baggage, and what would happen to their eternal soul if they died right now. You'd have to know all that in order to pass judgment on the works of God. And we don't have that. We don't have that. Do I think that there are lives that were taken in the Old Testament that that is potentially the most merciful thing he could have done? Yeah, I do. Because we make the mistake of thinking that it's all about this life. This 50, 80, 100 years. It's all about this. And if a person is treated unfairly in this breath of a life, God is to be judged. I hope that you would never judge me on my, as a fallen man, worst day as a dad. No one would ever judge someone based on one day or one second or one minute of their life. And we're fallen. 
We are fallen humans. But they'll judge God on this breath that a human experienced? Be careful. Be really careful with that. Be really careful with that. So what we do is we exchange the truth about God for a lie and we worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Is how good a person's life seems to be, to me, the most important thing? No. Is my understanding of God's goodness in every single situation the most important thing? It's not. But we act as if it is. Our world is so starving for a God that will tick off nobody. A God that we don't have to fight about. A God that's nice. A God that will never say that is wrong. A God that won't judge. That's a very confusing thing too. Does the Bible say don't judge? Depends. The Bible says that when I look at a life that has no Christ in it, that has not found the saving grace of the gospel, and I see fallenness and, and a wreck and things falling apart and just hopelessness and, and sin and filth, am I to judge that? No. But if you sit in a church pew with me and put his name on you, and go out and bash him and deny him and live in sin, I am called to judge that. The Bible says, guys, you're going to judge the nations. You can't figure out what's right and wrong amongst yourselves. You're going to go to a secular judge and figure out an, a, a fight? Come on. We are called to keep each other in line in life. We're called to drive each other to live for him in purity. We are. So does the Bible say don't judge? For the most part, yeah. Because most of the people in this world don't know him. If you're standing on a soapbox telling everybody how bad they are and they should be like you, yeah, you shouldn't do that. But if you come up to someone in love and say, hey, uh, it's on your Facebook page and all the scantily clothed friends you have, eee, not thinking that's a great idea. That is biblical. And the reason I would get fired up and in your face when you bring that up to me is because I have suppressed that truth and you just brought it up. And now I'm going to either have to deal with it or work to push it back down and that is just a pain in my butt on my day off. That's what's happening right there. Okay? Okay. The other night, Sarah said to me, listen, dude, this Facebook dude, all the time. I was not happy. And my brain was like, nitpicking. You're just nitpicking. I use that word. You use words you shouldn't use in a marriage when you're mad. But as I laid there in the dark, I was like, this is true about me. I'm drawn to something that will stimulate my brain. A story, uh, uh, something, news. I just, I'm busy. And I need to set this aside. And I literally got out of bed, 10.30 at night, went over to where my phone was charging and went, bing, what do you want to do with that? Dump it in the trash can. You want to ins uninstall this? Yes, I do. Do you want to just keep the basic mode? No. I didn't want to, listen, I could stop whenever I want. It's not a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. <clears throat> One more scripture. Timothy was a young man. Paul basically appointed him as a leader. He didn't grow up with a good dad. He's raised by his mom and his grandma. And he was young, and so people didn't regard him and didn't want to give him leadership because he was young. And Paul said, listen, don't let people talk down on you because you're a youth. God has called you and stand in this, right? This is what Paul says in 2 Timothy. And this has to do with 
his call on our lives in the world we live in. <clears throat> I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Jesus would not judge anybody. I thought that just said he was going to. <clears throat> and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The right way is never, you're a jerk and you need to knock it off. Even if it's true, because lots of times it is. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Do you think we're called to say, this is really what the Bible says? Do you think we're called to know what the Bible really says? We are not called to hide, okay? I am not asking you to go on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and pick fights. But there are people every day being led away by posts that are not truth. They're not truth. The word of God says if we see something that's unjust and we don't stand up and do something, the guilt for that injustice will fall on us. Remember 1 Corinthians 13. It's quoted at every wedding. It says, I can speak with the tongue of men and of angels. I could know all things. I could prophesy and know all these mysteries. But if I don't have love, it's like I'm standing next to your head with a symbol. Bang, 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 bang. You are going to get away from that noise. There has to be love. That doesn't mean just be nice. That doesn't mean, no matter what you say, tack on the end, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's not what it means. Right after it says love is patient. Love is kind. It endures suffering. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. It doesn't look for itself. It hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. And the most crazy awesome thing it says is that love never fails. When someone comes to my life and they say something lovingly that I want to run away from or I want to drop the gloves and start swinging, I will come back to that because I know that the only reason they would ever put themselves in a position where I could possibly hate them is because they actually care more about me than they do about them. Nobody ever signs up to be hated by someone. If someone comes to your life and says, I just, I think based on what I'm reading in the Bible that maybe this is a concern, they're not doing that because they'd really like you to hate them and talk about them on Facebook. It's because they love you and they care. They're not always going to be right, but we should be willing to consider what the word says and say, Lord, search my heart, know me, Lead me in the way everlasting that I would walk behind you and follow you all the days of my life. Right? As your pastor, I'm telling you this. This world is running away from the truth of the fact that God as a creator has set standards in our world. And he has put rules in place. We will all give an account for everything in our lives one day. Does he understand where you came from and what you're dealing with and your baggage and everything you know and don't and your weaknesses, yep. But it doesn't change the fact that we are responsible for what we do. We're responsible for what we know, for where we go, who we're with. And we need to love people but be concerned that we are on the path God has called us to at every step. Agree? All right. Don't ever forget Jesus' attitude with the woman who is caught in adultery. 
when he ran into people who were in sin and knew that they were in a place of responsibility, he had compassion for them. Compassion that will make a minister's head light on fire. Woman caught in adultery and all the men who are going to stone her go, hey, I'm cool with her not getting stoned. Where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. There, I think there are people who run away. They don't know what to do with that verse. How, Jesus doesn't condemn her? She was caught in adultery. I mean, isn't he God? Doesn't he have to judge? I think in that place, it was perfectly obvious that whatever had gone on, she knew where she stood before him. And her heart was repentant. And that's all he wants. Right? That's all he wants. The only people he ever got nasty with were the people who thought they had the answer and he was the problem. And that might sound extreme, but that's the world you live in. They're just not all coming from the Jewish background. They all think that they've got it all figured out and Jesus is the problem. Ain't going to be long and Jesus is going to be hate speech. I'm just telling you, don't think you're not headed in that direction. This world is becoming a cold place. Do I believe that there will come a day in my life where it's illegal for me to preach what I'm preaching today? Yes. 